Hi, and welcome to this week's Life Lessons teaching. It's great to be back with you all. Now, this week's teaching is a very important one for us. So many of our clients come to us believing that they are somehow emotionally wounded, damaged, or scarred by something that has happened to them in their past. And this is like a heavy anchor that weighs them down, not just emotionally, but also physically and spiritually. And they believe that nothing can be done about it. Well, in this week's teaching, we want to share with you a different and fresh perspective for you to consider. One that has emotionally empowered and liberated so many of our clients and allowed them to finally move on with their lives. Now, this teaching comes with a warning. It may be contrary to the message that you've heard from a lot of other therapists. It may also require a radical shift in your perspective in terms of who you are and your emotional health. But we truly hope that this teaching inspires you and empowers you and supports you. Okay, David, so what is your view on this idea of emotional wounds? So as you said in the opening, it's very important to us because it strikes right at the heart of one of our main teachings. You are the creator of your emotions. You are not the victim of them. So if you are the creator of your emotions, how can you be wounded by emotions. So you have to think about that. If you create the emotion, how can you be wounded by the creation of your own creation? And that is really the way that we look at it, totally different to what most people look at it. So you have to look at this word wound. So, but David, if I have had or experienced a very traumatic or shocking incident or episode in my life, whether it's in childhood or in adulthood, that has, I believe, a lot of people would say, I believe that has deeply emotionally affected and wound me, wounded me and damaged me and I haven't recovered. So there's two things there. We absolutely accept and I accept and I deal with it every day with my clients you can go through traumatic, massive incidences in your life that create an overwhelming emotion. Overwhelming. But that doesn't mean to say that you are wounded by them. You create the emotions. We are not saying emotions are wrong. I am not saying you should not create emotions. What I am saying is you have created them. So if you create the emotion, how can then that emotion wound you? Because you are constantly creating emotions. So here's the problem that I deal with with most of my clients who come to me with this legacy of long-term emotional wounding, is it's not the emotion that's wounded, it's the belief system that they haven't changed. And so if you maintain the same belief system, of course, you will create the same emotion. That's why that teaching is so important. People hear it. You are the creator of your emotions, not the victim. And they kind of nod and go, yeah, well, that makes sense, doesn't it? But they do not understand the depth of this teaching. It's life changing. I would put it that powerful. It is life changing for you that knowing that emotions are appropriate, Nothing wrong with emotions. I'm not trying to ignore emotions, but you are creating them. And if you've had a very serious incident in your childhood or in your teenage years or growing up, it is appropriate for you to create very strong, intense emotions. But it's always so, it's not appropriate for you to hold on to those emotions mm -hmm. by not changing the belief. And that's the crux. The of the issue really because it's totally appropriate if we have a shocking awful incident happen to us whatever that may be 
particularly as a child, when we aren't cognitively aware and we don't have an understanding of what's going on and we are dependent on other people. So experiencing that tsunami of red light feelings and emotions in that moment is entirely appropriate. appropriate. But as you say, to continue to hold on to those emotions and label them as emotional wounds and the, I guess in the moment, the, after the events, would the emotions naturally dissipate, but that somehow we are, how do we hold on to them then? So because we, we form a belief okay. because of that incident, and that could be abuse of some kind, it could be death, it could be a separation, it can be many, many, many things. There is not one higher than the other. It could be a very serious incident in your, in your life. And the emotion that you create at the result of that experience is appropriate. I'm going to repeat again. It is appropriate. But there is also a life lesson. This is what this series of, is called. There's a life lesson for you to learn in that incident. Because if you do not learn the life lesson, then you don't really hold on to the emotion. You keep on creating the emotion because you're holding on to your perception of the event. Mm -hmm. That's what continually creating, we call it the carousel of despair. You haven't, see a lot of therapists will tell you that your body stores emotions like some kind of an emotional saddlebag. You haven't got an emotional saddlebag. Human beings are not designed to hold emotions. You haven't got cupboards in your body that you go and store emotions in. You are constantly creating emotions by the structure of your beliefs and your thoughts. And so if that incident or incidences create a belief, then you just continue creating the same emotions. And so what you're saying is the incident creates emotions. That's entirely appropriate yes. because that's like a warning sign. We've got to do something about this. This is not appropriate. This shouldn't be happening, et cetera, et cetera. The incident is, is such an emotional shock for us that we put in place a belief about what's happened, about who we are, about the world around us, about who we can and can't trust, all those things. And it's, you're saying it's the belief that creates the emotional legacy. It's the belief that keeps, the inauthentic belief that keeps the emotion alive that we may label as an emotional wound or emotional damage or an emotional scar. So it's not the event that happened to us way back when, how many years or series of events. It's the belief that is creating, stimulating, aggravating those red light emotions within us right now. So that's well explained. So when you experience the emotion, it's not the emotion of 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, somehow stored in your body and pops its head up. You're creating a brand new emotion in that moment for a memory, for a belief that goes back to 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So the emotion is brand new. It's not a stored emotion. Mm, that's a good it's point. a stored belief. Okay. And that's why the two core things I try and say in each video, let me repeat it. You are the creator of your emotions, not the victim, because that's the trouble with I am emotionally wounded. That makes you a victim. That's why you are the creator, not the victim, and you are accountable for your beliefs. So what you have to look at is what is that belief? And as Alex has said, and I'm going to repeat again, it was totally appropriate for you to create a very tsunami, intense, overwhelming emotion at the time, but not 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, you are still creating a belief. The incident is gone. Mm -hmm. The person might not even be alive, but you are creating the belief. This is why this is a complete breakthrough and a turnaround from what other therapies teach. And so I guess if we, that can, what you've just explained is almost helps me understand why if I, 
If I think about a past event that was very traumatic or shocking for me, if, I hold, if I'm holding beliefs about the injustice, the unfairness, about how wrong it was for it to happen, you know, quite rightly. Yeah. But that's why yeah. I, if I think about that, if, I, if my self-talk ruminates on that, the red light emotion that I then experience is as fresh and as powerful and as hard hitting as the emotion I might have experienced 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, because it's being created by a belief which is I'm holding in the current. It, as you say, it's not that emotion I experience right now is not being created by the event 20, 30, 40 years ago. It's being stimulated by my current belief, which I keep on re-examining and I keep on determining, deter, very determinedly holding on to. That's right. The, the emotion isn't 30 years old, but the belief is 30 years old or 40 years old or 20 years old. And that's what you have to look at. You have to change that belief, that perception, that standard, whatever you want to call it, that perception of the event. Once you look at the life lesson and you change that belief system, the emotion will immediately change. This is what I get the most pushback from my clients. They say, well, emotions don't change that quickly, David. They do. Emotions change immediately. You can change an emotion from one red light feelings to a green light immediately. I would prefer you to come more into Wu Wei to be logical, to look at it from a more wide spiritual base, not the base of an inner child, as Alex says who's ill-equipped to deal with what was going on, what I teach is to come back to your Shen, your spirituality, the thing that defines you of being this awesome human being that I believe you are, and then re-examine the event from that perception, not from a six, seven, eight, nine-year-old child's perception, from a spiritual perception. And a spirituality is, for me, who you are. That ability to be able to look at all of the, like a macro view, mm -hmm. look at all of the circumstances, not a micro view looking down the lens of a three, six, seven, eight, nine year old child. Yeah. And, and, and as you say, someone who at that time you were ill equipped, not experienced, Absolutely. didn't have the life experience. But I want to talk a little bit more about our perception of events and, our, you know, you talk about we created a belief in that at that time, how that belief could be unhelpful, because you also talked about being a victim. Now, I want to be clear when we just talk about being a victim, if we believe we are emotionally wounded right now, you're saying that makes us a victim yes. and we are not a victim. No. But that's not to say that at that point in time of the original incident that created the emotional shock or trauma for us, that we were not a victim at that no, time. No, I'm not saying that. I'm yeah. saying that that incident was an incident that somebody might have done something that you couldn't control because of your age, because of your stature, because of the situation, and they impose themselves on you. You see, it's very difficult because there's so many different different circumstances. So I, I gotta give you more generality. Now at that time, that may have been that you're a victim, but that doesn't mean that you're a victim for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. That doesn't brand you across the top of the head that you're a victim. And in fact, what I say to my clients, that if that was such a, dysfunctional situation, let's call it. Isn't it amazing? It amazes me that you got through it. Didn't you do bloody well to able to survive and get through that situation? I think you're amazing to have done that. Why then do you keep the belief and create this new kind of emotion that keeps you locked into that way? That's why you have to change your belief system. And also in terms of perception, what I guess what we're not saying is that whatever happened to create this emotional trauma or emotional shock 
We're not saying it didn't happen. We're not saying it was okay to happen. We're not saying that what happened was appropriate. We're saying the reality is reality. It happened and it may have been bad and inappropriate and wrong, but that in terms of changing our perception, we're not denying that. But what are we talking about then? If we're not denying what happened, what are we talking about in terms of change perception? So I'll give you, for instance, a client. A client says in his opinion, his mother could not create love for him. His mother was very harsh on on him. She valued his brothers and sisters above him. And then he comes up with a belief. That means that I'm unlovable. So I'm dealing with him now in his 50s, and his belief is he is unlovable. And when we did the golden thread, and we went down, so his understanding of why he believes he's unlovable, because his perception that his mother could not create love for him. Now, to him, that seems very logical. So when we were then deconstructing his belief system, I said to him, okay, let me ask you this. If your cousin, a child of six or seven, came up to you, as, your, as an uncle, and says, uncle, I do not believe my mum loves me. Would you say to that child, well, that means you're unlovable? And he laughed. He says, of course I wouldn't. That'd be silly. I said, but that's exactly what you're doing. You have to change that perception. Even if he was right, which is open to debate, but let's say he was right. His mother favoured his brothers and sisters over him. Does that make him unlovable? In his belief system, yes. And then for the next 45 years, he is now living through the filter that he is unlovable. And he creates these emotions and he then tells me, well, it's because I'm badly wounded by what my mother said to me. He, she put, she, this is his words, She put a shadow on my soul. That's what he said. And yet when I gave him the analogy of a six-year-old child coming to him and saying, uncle, he laughed. He said, of course you wouldn't say that. But that's what he's been saying to himself for 45 years. And that's what I mean. And of course, David, I, you know, I totally get that as a child when this individual, I know this is a reoccurring theme, what you've just described there for one of your clients. That's a reoccurring theme for many of your clients. In different circumstances. In different circumstances and situations. But as a child, it's quite reasonable for us as a child to draw those conclusions, even though they were wrong conclusions. It's quite reasonable for a young child to draw those conclusions. But what we now need to do is go back and reflect on, you know, if I believe I'm emotionally wounded, why is that? Yes. Who, where are the emotions coming from? That's the key. Are they coming from what happened to me 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, that incident or the way I was treated when I was younger or what happened to me? Or are these red light emotions actually coming from a belief that I hold dear to myself, but it's a belief that is not authentic. It's not a, a belief that's not true. It's a belief that was created by me as a child or me when I was a little bit emotionally less kind of experienced in life. But I'm now, as an adult, holding this dear. And as you say, it's, refl- it's affecting everything, the way I perceive myself and everything around me. Absolutely. And that's why, as a child, children, as we've said on many, many videos, do not see emotions that they are creating from inside out. They see it from outside in. They see emotions as like an attack, like an arrow shooting at their heart. And so the word wounded mm. for a child is very descriptive. Unappropriate. Because it, it, yeah. it feels like yeah, you've been yeah, yeah. shot in your yeah, chest yeah. or an arrow sticking in your heart or somebody's kicked you in your stomach. You are absolutely saying the right childlike things. But the problem is that filters down into your belief system. And then that's the belief you're left with for the rest of your life. If you do not go down, find the golden thread as we did with a client, 
And I know, I, I hopefully I'll see him again. I think he's booked in again. But he's now got to come and kind of readjust his thinking. Readjust. We're not saying it didn't happen. I'm not even saying, I'm not even having the discussion his mother loved him or didn't love him because I don't know. I'm saying even if your mother didn't love you, aren't you amazing to have come through that childhood? And aren't you amazing to learn to love yourself? Because I'll take on, on the, his, his argument, how can I love me? How can I love myself, David, when my mother didn't love me? That's his argument. How can I create love for myself when my mother didn't love me? And I said, do you create love for your children? Of course I do. Do you create love for your wife? Of course I do. But I can't create love for myself. Why? Because my mother didn't love me. And that's the logic. It's a childlike logic. And that's what you have to go down. And using the word like wounded and victim means you will never mm -hmm. break mm -hmm. that belief system. It's like an iron fist around you. Remember the Chinese call it like a kernel, a vow that you're holding on to. And I can tell you, this is the most interesting position that I have with my clients, first of all, finding this kernel of the vow and then trying to ease it out so at least they can look at it from a different perception. Mm. And so that example you've just given whereby, and I know, as I say, it applies to many of your clients, there's a misunderstanding about how their parents related to them, whether they loved them, whether they were lovable or whether they are lovable. But that can be extrapolated to real situations where people as children have suffered actual abuse, emotional Absolutely. abuse, physical abuse, violence in the home, or it can be more of the kind of misunderstandings like the example you give. That's right. So I'm giving that example just as an example. But if you take that example and apply it to yourself, you see that everyone is slightly different. And that's why I love working with, as with my clients because each client brings bring me a slightly different va variation. So I feel honored. I feel honored to be able to go down their golden thread and to be able to show a different light on it. And I absolutely understand that if you've been holding on to this kernel of a vow, for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, it is such a challenge. And, you know, some of my clients find it very difficult that we're challenging this kind of sacred vow that they've been ho ho holding on to. But as you said at the beginning, once they open up that vow, once they see that they're the only one that's holding on to it, no one else is, it is life changing. And many times the, the, the statement life changing is bandied about without having any substance. This is life changing. When you change that filter, your, the way you look at the world, life changes. In my view, that's what enlightenment is. Like someone switched on the light and you suddenly see things in a different perception and through a different magnifying glass and this is life changing for you and this is why we do these videos i know at the beginning this can you get a lot of resistance if you've been thinking you've been wounded but kind of go through that and kind of go to the logic go through that logic <laughs> but david you almost make it sound too easy and i'm thinking that my inner child if I, if my inner child, so that adult part of my mind that is, is that legacy from my childhood, my childhood beliefs, that inner child within me, my inner child does not want to let go. My inner child, in some respects, feels quite comfortable with the idea of emotional wounds and that because to let go of those, to kind of think, well, either these don't exist or that the red light emotions that I am creating now when I think about what happened to me, if I take self-responsibility for that, it seems very hard because it's almost like it's, it's as if I'm having to forget what happened or absolve the person who did whatever they did to me in the past of responsibility. And my inner child finds that really difficult to let that go. Well, because it's got the wrong understanding. We are not 
absorbing the person or the thing or the situation. We are not saying you have to forget about it or shut it off. I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying just look at it from a different perception. The difficulty is that you say it's not that easy. Well, you have to be accountable for your beliefs. And we've done many videos on reparenting the inner child. You can look at, I'm sure Alex will put them up. You have to go and really help your inner child in this circumstance because the inner child is not stupid. He knows this isn't working, but he's so used to the familiarity. Remember, as human beings, we're very pattern driven. Now, your inner child may be very stubborn. He may or she may put up a fight. But as I said, I know and you know they're not stupid. You are not stupid. And so you have to go back and you have to clear all the confusion and you have to go back to the point, to the vow, and you have to look at it from a different, a fresh perception that widens the view. So the child can hold its same view, or it could hold this view, or it could hold this view. And what you're doing it, you're giving it alternatives mm -hmm. that he's not stuck on the same track. He can choose a different track. Now a child, then you're offering him choice and you're encouraging him in what I would call emotional education. So I guess what you're saying is that when we're doing this deep inner reflection work, that we need to go back and think about the original incident and think about what are the beliefs we hold yes. in relation to what happened, yes. in relation to who we are because of what happened, and almost not deny what happened, but reframe it in a way that reflects the truth, in the way that the client you spoke about is totally lovable, is totally divine, and that they are not defined by what they believe their mother thought about them, whether him, the mother did or exactly. did not think that. Exactly. And then we have to, once we have that appreciation ourselves, we then have to speak to that part of our mind that we call the inner child and kind of lovingly explain and educate that part of our mind which is so stuck on this idea that it can't recover from the past and that's why i use that example because as as that client would not speak to a physical child and say well that means you're unlovable he would then educate the child and say well, well you, you know your mom's going through difficulty and she's got six children and may not you know you would explain to that child and that's how you have to explain to your inner child. You have to give it some alternatives rather than this solid way that you've been thinking that all, that all your life. Because let's go back to the, to, to the subject. That will, every time you think about it, will create another realm mm -hmm. of emotions. They're not the original emotions from 20, 30, 40 years ago. They're emotions that you're creating in the now, yeah. in the moment, and you are creating them. That person who did that thing is not creating them. In the example that I use, his mother is now died. She's not creating any emotions in his body. He is creating the emotions. Yeah. yeah. So when we reflect on this, it's about, I guess, not only acknowledging that if our inner child or if if as a child we believed we weren't good enough there was something wrong with us we couldn't cope we were unlovable or we ha believed that you know i can't trust anyone uh, the world's against me anyone who uh, takes charge of me is going to take advantage of me so not only have we got to reframe and get more authentic and true and aligned with our beliefs about ourselves but we also have to reframe and get more authentic, true and aligned with our views of the world around us. And I guess for that part, that second part, we're talking about some level of acceptance about what happened. Well, acceptance about reality, about yeah. what happened, because we can't change what happened. I'm very sorry if this is you and there's a really serious incident. We can't change that. That was done several years ago. We can reframe and change your response to that incident and that's you being accountable 
That's you taking responsibility. That's you stopping being a victim. That's you being the master of your life. And this is what I want for you. And the way you go back, you I want you to go back from a spiritual perception, a spiritual understanding, not go back and look at this through the eyes of a six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old child, because quite as Alex said, er, like earlier, they haven't got the breadth of life experience that you've got now. So this is why the idea of reparenting is much better than going back as the child yourself. Because if you go back as the child, you see things through the child's eye. You have to almost go back as the parents and speak to that part of your mind. Remember, we call it the inner child. You could call it your ego, your emotional mind, your subconscious mind. It doesn't really matter. It's just a label. But you go back with the knowledge, with the understanding to go back and look at that situation, reframe it, reset it, and then the emotions will abate and eventually stop mm -hmm. much quicker than you think yeah. that they will be able to. And I have the evidence from my clients. Once you change your belief, your emotions change. And I'm going to go back just to, just to, just to emphasize the important teaching here. And this teaching is not something that you can accept. Some, some of my clients after a session say, I'm 90% there, David, I'm 95% there. You create your emotions. I'm 95% there, David. That means you're not there. You have to sit, and if you take one thing away from this video, sit and think about that teaching. You are the creator of your emotions, not the victim. And then once you get that 100%, you can no longer be the victim, wounded, hurt by your own emotions. That's the key. Brilliant. Thank you, David. Well, I hope this teaching has given you some fresh ideas, a fresh perspective, a different way of looking at your emotional feelings now and how you relate to what's happened to you in the past. We have lots and lots more videos for you on inner child work, inner child reparenting, and understanding how our Wu Wei wisdom teachings on emotional health and emotional balance. So all of the topics we've touched upon in today's video. If you have enjoyed the video, if you have any questions, please do comment below and also share the video with someone else who you think would also benefit. Every week, David works by video call with clients all over the world on exactly the sort of issues we've talked about today. And if you're interested in learning more about David's sessions, I will put a link below with more information from you, for you. Please do also subscribe to our YouTube channel. We produce new videos every week and we'd love to share your journey with you. Take care and we'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.